Seminary Talk for the day. And it's an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. Dr. Lovejoy is a professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University. He holds a BS and PhD in biology from Yale University. He's been very influential in political as well as uh, scientific communities. On the political side, he served on the Science and Environmental Council under the President Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations. He was a World Bank's Chief Biodiversity Advisor and served as a Senior Advisor for the UN Foundation. He coined the term Biological Diversity and formed the, the popular long-term series Nature on public TV. He also uh, co-edited books such as uh, Climate Change and Biodiversity and is credited with founding the field of climate change biology. Dr. Lovejoy has been awarded many prestigious awards, including the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and most recently he was recognized by the Blue Planet Prize. Today in his talk, he's going to uh, share with us his um, solution to climate change. So please join me welcome Dr. Lovejoy. Thank you. 
But what you would not have done is this detailed history of the temperature of the planet for the last couple hundred thousand years, and most particularly uh, the upper right, the last 10,000 years, which is a period of unusual stability. Uh, and that includes all recorded human history, a certain amount of unrecorded human history, the origins of agriculture, the origins of human settlement. I mean, basically, the entire human uh, enterprise is based on the assumption of a stable climate. And in that same 10,000 years, all ecosystems have been adjusting to a stable climate. And of course, that's changing. That's no secret. Uh, and the first uh, climate system uh, has been, begun to respond. We're at about 0.8 to 0.9 degrees uh, above the industrial uh, levels of the temperature. Uh, and emissions continue to go up uh, beyond the worst case scenario uh, in the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projections. Not a great picture. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about the impacts that we've seen so far uh, in nature, and then where it might be going and what might be done about it. So, uh, some of the signals in the natural world are around the solid and liquid phases of water, the most dramatic being the overall decline of uh, sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. This only goes to about 2007, uh, but it has continued uh, to go down the trend. So, lakes are freezing later in the fall, ice breaking up uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, glaciers are in retreat in most parts of the world. The glacier uh, National Park is well on its way to being that only in Maine. And in the tropics, where there are glaciers on high mountains like Mount Kilimanjaro, all tropical glaciers are retreating at a rate that they will be gone within 15 years. Uh, we're also seeing increases in sea level rise, no longer just because of the thermal expansion of water, now because of the addition of melt of ice on land, like in Greenland. Uh, and we are seeing sea level rise in places like the eastern shore of Maryland, where there is combined natural subsidence of the land with sea level rise, so that the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge is well on its way to being a marine refuge. Uh, and then there is, in addition, the increasing probability of uh, more intense tropical storms, indeed more extreme weather events generally. Uh, and there is absolutely no question about the, the significant increase in the occurrence of wildfires in the American West uh, because of lesser snowpack in winter uh, and longer, drier, warmer summers. Uh, the rest of what I'm going to talk about is all about the living part of the planet. And we are seeing uh, uh, species like lilacs uh, blooming earlier in New England, a whole series of plant species uh, blooming <coughs> earlier in the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew. Uh, it's not just plant species which are changing, uh, animal species are changing their uh, annual cycles as well. So tree swallows uh, nesting earlier, uh, laying eggs earlier uh, in northern part of this country, a uh, couple bird species that have even ceased to migrate. And more importantly, we are seeing species that are beginning to change where they occur. So the Edis checker spot butterfly, one of the two most studied species of butterflies uh, in North America, has clearly been moving northward and upward in altitude in response to changing climate. Similar kinds of patterns have been seen with butterfly species uh, in Europe. Uh, in the Sierra, in Northern California, snow no longer falls to 
1,200 feet above sea level, only to about 3,500 feet. Uh, that is affecting the ponderosa pine, which are dependent on that uh, feature of their winter, so that's turning into dieback in that summer. Uh, and in the Joshua Tree National Park, literally the Joshua Tree is not one by one, but through seeds and proper yields are moving outside of the park. So nature is definitely on the move. Uh, and the National Arbor Day Foundation, which clearly is not some wildlife terrorist extremist organization, uh, but literally about people who just like to plant trees, actually found it necessary to do a new hardiness zone map uh, to guide their members uh, as to which species of trees they could be successful in planting uh, where they live. So the changes are occurring not only on land, uh, but also in uh, the oceans. So plankton distributions are changing, fish distributions are changing. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, the eelgrass communities, which are particularly uh, important for things like blue crabs and quite uh, diverse uh, communities. It turns out that eelgrass is very sensitive to uh, warmer temperatures, uh, and as a consequence, the, uh, the southern limit, the ending limit of hillgrass in the Chesapeake Bay has been moving steadily uh, southward or, or northward uh, every year. So these kinds of changes uh, are not just occurring in polar regions, not in, just in boreal regions or in temperate regions. We're also seeing changes in tropical regions as well. Uh, there they tend to be less about changes in temperature uh, as opposed to changes in moisture regimes. regimes. So this is the legendary uh, cloud forest of Monte Verde in Costa Rica. Uh, and what has been happening there is uh, that the altitude at which clouds form uh, has been uh, becoming higher and higher, uh, meaning less cloud condensation for uh, a habitat which is totally dependent on condensation from clouds for its source of moisture. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of uh, what are called decoupling events, where two events in nature uh, which have coincided for a very long time uh, turn out to be linked by different systems, one responding to temperature, the other depending to day length. On day length, so you get things like snowshoe hares uh, now often exposed uh, in the spring, still wearing their white uh, winter pelage. Uh, another decoupling example is the black guillemot, which nests on the northern shores of Alaska, uh, and basically flies to the edge of the sea ice to get the Arctic cod uh, to feed themselves and to feed their young. And it's becoming, uh, it's become an increasingly greater distance for them to fly to get to the edge of the ice and the Arctic cod. So some of those nesting colonies uh, have already failed. So this totally incomprehensible slide, which I would penalize any of my students for putting on the screen, is there to make the point that what I've just been describing uh, is no longer just the individual anecdote or example. Uh, this is statistically robust. Nature is on the move in response to climate change almost anywhere one looks in the world. So what we've been looking at up to this point basically relatively minor ripples in the natural habit of the planet. Uh, the real question is, what does it look like looking ahead? Uh, and one can do uh, exercises where you look at the climatic envelope in which a particularly uh, well-known species is known to occur, like sugar maple, and then project ahead to where that <coughs> climate envelope might be a double pre-industrial levels of CO2. Uh, so 
If you do that in sugar maple, all five of the major computer models for uh, climate change uh, all make it very clear that if you want to enjoy autumn foliage with sugar maples, if you want to get the maple syrup or the maple sugar, you're going to have to go to Canada if we let CO2 levels go to double the industrial. And similar kinds of exercises have been done for trees uh, in Europe. And one of the important things to bear in mind is that these changes, uh, as at Monteverde, are not just about temperature, they're also about moisture. And the latter is much harder for the, the climate change models to actually uh, give us a full sense of. Uh, but the important point to make here is in terrestrial systems, the two most important physical parameters for living things uh, are temperature and moisture. And in aquatic systems, it's temperature and pH. And all of those are changing. So they also interact with some of the other stresses we put on the natural environment. Uh, so here, a combination of land use change and changing climate uh, in Western Africa led Lake Chad to decline to 5% of its original extent. Uh, not very good for the local population. Uh, we're also going to see changes in aquatic systems, particularly around uh, cold-loving species like trout. Um, and we're going to see a lot of changes in species that occur in high places uh, because while not every species moves up, tracking its climate in a warming world, uh, a great proportion of them do do so. And at a certain point, uh, animals like pikas will have no further up to go. So high altitude species are particularly vulnerable. Uh, and this will give you an example uh, looking at the endemic vertebrate species in the rainforests of Queensland and Australia, uh, in which, as you can see, with increasing warmth, they basically have the future. So, sea level is also an issue uh, for coastal species. Uh, some will respond well, some not so well, uh, but it's particularly an issue for island species, and even more of an issue uh, for low-lying uh, island species like the key deer. Uh, you know, I was with the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service on Tuesday afternoon, uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do with that key deer as sea level rises, uh, with no easy answer at the site. So, and obviously there are a whole bunch of ice-related species uh, like polar bears, uh, which will be particularly effective. So, the more important point uh, is with increasing climate change, uh, there are complications that we can anticipate. Uh, and the first of these has to do with the way we can basically manage the landscapes of this planet creating uh, a lot of fragmented habitat. Uh, so this is the classic illustration from the, the, the first paper on island biogeography uh, that the, this township in Wisconsin and how the forest uh, went from being continuous in 1831 in the upper left to just a bunch of fragments uh, in the lower right at 1950. I mean, that is the classic pattern of what happens to nature almost everywhere uh, in the planet. So, if you think about it, of course climate change is not new in the history of life on Earth. Uh, and we certainly know that glaciers came and went, we talked about it earlier today, uh, many times uh, without a great apparent loss of biodiversity. Uh, the big difference is that today is that climate changes 
the biota will have to respond with landscapes which look like this, which basically create an obstacle course for species as they would naturally move to track their changing climate. So that particular one is something that we actually can do something about. Just put a lot more natural connections back in the landscape, modify the interstate highway system so species can go over and under a whole series of things like that. And in particular, uh, if you just restore riparian vegetation in the landscape, it puts an unbelievable amount of connectivity uh, back into the landscape. The, the next complication, it's much harder to do something about. Uh, and basically, we know in the past uh, and in the future, it's the individual species that move. It's not the whole natural community uh, as a unit. The individual species move each in their own direction and at their own rate. Uh, and so this is an illustration of what happened with three mammal species and two tree species and an insect species in Europe <coughs> after the retreat of the last glacier. And you can see there is no common pattern uh, as to how the species moved in response to that change. So basically, if we allow a lot more climate change to actually happen, uh, we're just basically going to see these, all these species move individually and the ecosystems which we know will disassemble. And then the surviving species will reassemble into uh, combinations which are really hard to imagine uh, in, a, in advance, let alone manage. So the, the basic message here is the more climate change we allow to have happen, to happen, the harder it is, uh, harder it will be to actually manage the consequences. So the third complication is that despite the fact that all computer models are linear and gradual, uh, we know that the climate does not operate that way. We know that there are uh, thresholds and shifts, uh, the most dramatic being when the global conveyor belt, which moves moisture and uh, warmth around the globe, uh, shuts down. It's just been known to shut down in the past. Uh, but even long before that kind of um, system shift, if you want to call it that, uh, we are seeing big threshold changes in natural systems. Uh, and in North America, the most prominent is what's happening to the coniferous forests of the western part of the continent uh, because of tipping the balance in favor of native bark beetles. So this is the uh, prevalence of mountain pine beetle log outbreaks uh, from the early 1960s uh, to around 2002. Uh, at the beginning, you're just seeing a few little red pinpricks, and then cold winter shuts it down, and it starts all over uh, the next year. But as time goes on, and it's been a warmer and warmer climate, more over winter. Uh, eventually the summer is longer and another generation is possible. Uh, and even when you get a cold winter, uh, it bounces back um, very strongly. So you will see a summary slide for this uh, outbreak in British Columbia. Here we are. Uh, and so virtually, you know, almost anyone where one goes in the, in the west of this continent uh, from southern Alaska uh, all the way down to southern Colorado, uh, there are a vast number of trees dead. You go from Denver Airport to Dale, 70% of the trees are dead. It becomes really hard to imagine what those forests uh, will turn into. So the other big change like this is in the oceans with tropical coral reefs. 
and basically the, the tropical coral reef is filtered out in partnership between the tropical uh, alga and a coral animal. Uh, and with not a great deal of warming for not a very long period of time, uh, that relationship breaks down. And the coral animal ejects the alga and, alga, and you go from this extraordinary, highly diverse, technicolor, uh, highly productive world, very important to 5% of, of humanity that lives within 100 years on uh, to coral, coral bleaching events in which the world goes from technicolor to black and white and the diversity, the productivity, and the benefit for local communities crashes. Uh, so this is what tropical coral reefs looked like when I was a graduate student. Uh, the first bleaching event was described, observed in 1983. Uh, and now it is a very frequent occurrence. So it's not a pretty future for tropical coral reefs if we let uh, uh, climate change continue to progress at the rate we are currently doing it. So then there are things which are even bigger in scale, which I have decided to call system change. Uh, changes which are on just an enormous scale. So one of the really interesting ones, uh, which we're, I think, seeing previews of, uh, involves sort of a hydrological cycle of the planet. This is actually a model of how moisture is generated and moves around the globe, mostly over the equator and mostly over the oceans, but with some interesting exceptions. If you look on the right, look at the moisture coming off the tropical Atlantic, uh, it tends to continue to be generated <coughs> as the air mass moves across the Amazon basin until finally it hits the high wall of the Andes, drops a lot of rain, and creates that, the largest river system uh, on the planet. Uh, but some of it also gets deflected north and south, indeed as far south as northern Argentina. Well, it's been obvious for a long time that too much deforestation uh, could undercut the hydrologic cycle. Uh, a couple versions of, of computer models uh, of climate change have suggested that climate change actually could affect the system uh, and create dieback in the southern and eastern Amazon. Simply not enough moisture to support tropical rainfalls. Uh, and we've seen what may be previews of Amazon dieback. Uh, and historically, uh, unprecedented droughts in 2005 and in 2010. So were that to happen, it would be a loss of a tremendous amount of biodiversity, a huge pulse of carbon uh, added to the atmosphere, contributing to further climate change. Uh, and pretty miserable impacts for the people who live in that part of the Amazon. Well, the good news here is the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment actually is taking this quite seriously and is developing uh, a plan to do some major reforestation to build back the margin of safety uh, on that particular one. Uh, but when you sort of look at all of these things together, what we're edging towards is affecting elements of the Earth system that we actually know very little about. Uh, and it just doesn't make any sense to go there. So, uh, another system change, uh, which went unremarked until 2005, uh, when it should have been obvious from just basic high school chemistry, but almost Nobody was thinking about it. I certainly wasn't thinking about it. Uh, it's while everybody was saying, you know, it's really great that the oceans are absorbing a huge amount of the CO2 that's emitted every year. Uh, nobody was thinking about how some of that CO2 would actually uh, be converted into carbon, carbonic acid to make the oceans increasingly acidic. So the oceans today are 
tenth or a pH unit uh, more acid than in pre-industrial times. Uh, and you know that that's uh, basically a logarithmic scale. So that's essentially 30% more acid than in pre-industrial times. Uh, and of course that has enormous consequences for the tens of thousands of species which build their skeletons uh, and their shells uh, from calcium carbonate, uh, including the, the small ones. We want you to go. There we are. Uh, like the pteropods, uh, other, otherwise called sea butterflies, are tiny little things like that, uh, which exist in untold numbers uh, at the base of food chains uh, in the North Atlantic and off of Alaska. Uh, and the pteropod is actually a little snail, and the foot of the snail is modified to sort of be able to flap <coughs> so it can maintain itself uh, in the water column. Uh, and effects are already being seen on the shells of pteropods uh, from existing acidity. So, this sequence will take us through the various levels of, of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and what it means for the potential to have tropical coral reefs. The really key part to observe is that little graph at the top uh, as it moves from the green and blue favorable zone uh, to yellow uh, and red unfavorable zone. So, 280 parts per million, of course, is where we started at pre-industrial. Uh, this is 380, we're already at 400. 450 uh, is approximately uh, close to doubling pre-industrial CO2. Uh, and were we to allow it to go to like uh, 550, which is, I guess, close to doubling. Um, you are basically in a world which cannot support tropical coral reefs. So, the point here is there are a lot of places we don't really want to go in that future projection. And, and the most important thing to do about it uh, is to try and figure out what would be a relatively safe place to stop on this temperature excursion. Uh, so, countries of this world have agreed uh, about a target of two degrees, and that's simply because they thought it was doable, not because it has any intrinsic value or meaning to it. Uh, and a number of us have concluded that two degrees is in fact too much. Uh, it has all kinds of implications for uh, the cryosphere, the Arctic sea ice, uh, the polar ice regions, uh, but it's also really bad for ecosystems because if we're seeing what I've already described to you at 0.8 to 0.9, what we would see at 2 degrees uh, is almost uh, unimaginable. So the question then becomes, uh, a, how to get across to the public that this is not a sensible target. Uh, and the one liner is this. If the last time the planet was two degrees warmer, sea level was at least four to six meters higher. So what you read about is people talking about how fast is sea level going to change, when in fact we know what the end point is and it's not a great place to be. So, uh, this is the Royal Society suggesting that instead of 2 degrees and 400 parts per million, that 350 parts per million probably would be a place to try and stop. Uh, so we could actually have tropical coral reefs. Uh, well, the issue, of course, is we're already at 400. So what are we going to do about this? Uh, other than to go to some local watering hole and never really emerge. Uh, so there is, in fact, something we can do about it. Uh, so Jim Hansen is by far and away the best known spokesperson for 300 
parts per million, three every 50, uh, but there are an increasing number of people who now are getting uh, the importance of this. So the difficulty is that if we wanted to stop at two degrees at current emissions levels uh, and current emissions patterns, uh, global emissions would have to peak in 2016. So is it all over? No, it's not all over. So what can be done about this? So this is Dr. Planner, and he's made his sort of diagnosis, right? And now he is prescribing things to the patient. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of things one can do, uh, revising conservation strategies uh, to basically make biodiversity and natural systems uh, more resilient in the face of climate change. Include obvious one, but increasing natural productivity, uh, but also minimizing all series of other things that are stressing uh, the natural world to avoid negative synergies. Uh, and then there's this huge energy agenda, uh, which I know something about, but that's not really uh, my expertise. There's a lot that can be done in that space, particularly if we, re we redo the sort of subsidies so that they are favorable uh, to renewable energy as opposed to uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, so one piece one can do about greenhouse gas emissions uh, that's great for biodiversity is spend less time and energy uh, on a lot of other things and just reduce the amount of profitable deforestation over the year. So emissions are probably nowadays more like 15% from tropical deforestation. Uh, so that obviously is a useful thing to do. Uh, but more important is to try and think about <coughs> this equation. This is what happens every year in terms of the greenhouse gas uh, concentration in the atmosphere. A bunch from tropical deforestation, uh, CO being emitted, uh, at least five to six times that uh, from burning old photosynthesis, the, the fossil fuels, and about uh, half goes in the atmosphere, and the other half is divided between the land uh, and the oceans. So the question is, is there some kind of way to play with that equation so in fact we might even be able to change the direction of one of those arrows? And the answer is uh, yes, but you've got to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, because it stays up there a long time, uh, trapping heat, uh, with the only good news here uh, being that it doesn't do it immediately. So if you can pull down the CO2 level in the atmosphere before it has trapped some of that heat, you can avoid a lot of impending climate change. So there are two things you can do to achieve that. One is to uh, lower atmospheric CO2 through ecosystem restoration. Uh, and because I think that's probably not enough to get this under control, we need to actually be thinking uh, very hard about non-biological methods of doing that, uh, which is expensive. Uh, but the, the, the really good news here is what natural systems can do. So twice in the history of life on Earth, there have been screamingly high levels of CO2 brought down to pre-industrial levels by natural processes. And the first time was with the arrival of plants on land, building a lot of biomass, uh, and literally sucking a lot of CO2 uh, back out of the atmosphere, but also through the formation of soil, uh, which involves weathering processes, but a lot of diversity of organisms and processes, living processes in the soil, so literally a biodiversity symphony that achieved that. 
And the second time it happened, uh, it was with the arrival of modern flowering plants doing all of that uh, more efficiently. Uh, so that gives you some sense of the promise, but we can't wait around for that to happen naturally uh, because it takes tens of millions of years. So the, the good news uh, is, in fact, a fair chunk of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere uh, comes from two or three centuries of major uh, destruction and degradation of ecosystems. And a good portion of that could be brought back uh, through an aggressive, at scale, uh, planet-wide effort uh, at restoration of, of ecosystems. So when I first thought about this, uh, just at the beginning of the uh, Obama administration, this was a simple little diagram that I drew. Uh, and the REDD on the left uh, refers to the UN term for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. Uh, the only real numbers are on this are the ones on the left. The 280 pre-industrial level, the 350 supposed safe level, uh, the 390 where uh, things happen to be at the time. Uh, so probably not quantitatively properly represented in this diagram is the green section, but it's basically there to represent all the carbon that you could put pull back out of the atmosphere through a really systematic approach to ecosystem restoration. Uh, and that's what I call the wild solution to climate change. So a major role here for forests and how we manage them uh, and do reforestation. And yesterday morning, I was over at the World Resources Institute uh, and collected a couple of their really interesting analyses talk about uh, the forest part of this uh, exercise. Uh, so, so, really, so uh, this in their analysis is places where forests used to grow uh, or the ecosystem is highly degraded and where it's more intact uh, and still something you would call forest. So potentially, all of this area uh, represented in yellow and orange here uh, could be uh, restored. And I don't even have a, a carbon figure to give you for what that might turn into. Uh, it's, uh, it's not something you're going to be able to do everywhere anyway. Uh, you know, highly densely populated places like India, uh, there's going to be the limit to what you can do there, but they're already talking there about a million, uh, uh, I guess a million square kilometers in new agroforestry. Uh, so you can begin to uh, actually build up some serious numbers here. So basically, in a rough kind of way, uh, one could design a program where about half a billion tons of carbon are pulled out of the atmosphere uh, every year through the way we restore and manage forests. There's another half billion tons a year that one could pull out of the atmosphere by restoring degraded grazing lands. Uh, and what do you get when you do that? You get better grazing. Uh, skipping for the moment. Contribution of livestock to greenhouse gases. Uh, and we can modify agricultural systems so instead of leaking carbon, uh, they actually accumulate carbon. And what do you do when you get that? You get more uh, soil fertility. Uh, so together, those three, if you did it for 50 years, would give you uh, 50 parts per million less in the atmosphere that much less carbon. So this is what I call my terminal quicksonic dream, uh, which is actually to recognize uh, that the planet works as a biophysical system. 
should be managed as a living planet. Uh, and we also, there's some new numbers coming out which suggest there's some additional amount that can be pulled out by restoring coastal wetlands, so-called blue carbon. Uh, so in the end, uh, we're going to have to do all of that uh, at a period of time where we're adding 2 billion more people to the planet. So there's an agricultural challenge as well. Uh, and that will, in the end, mean a serious uh, land use challenge. Uh, approaches to agriculture, which includes less waste, probably change in diet, greater productivity, uh, but also some really careful land use planning and management so we can maximize all these values uh, and ultimately uh, take care of those societal needs at the same time uh, as we re-green the emerald planet by treating it as the biophysical system that it is and making it more habitable. Thank you very much.